Cum găsi la emisiunea Știință și Cunoaștere? În urmă cu 10 ani am început o muncă laborioasă la o carte despre schimbări climatice. Problematica este atât de complexă încât era imposibil să stabilesc cele mai importante conexiuni dintre fenomenele naturale, influența omului și impactul climei asupra societății umane. Dar dificultatea nu era determinată doar pentru că aveam această barieră a complexității sistemului climatic, ci și din cauza abordării didactice. Știința mediului nu este o disciplină unică, precum fizica, matematica sau chimia, ci ea este o multidisciplină formată din aproape toate celelalte științe și domenii care sunt congruente între anumite limite, inclusiv istorie și pictură. Colecției de date ce însumau 658 de pagini îi lipsea de fapt tocmai acest ingredient secret care să le unească într-o viziune multidisciplinară. Exact acest lucru mi l-a oferit profesorul Tim Ball în cele 5 ore din al doilea interviu plus cele două ore din primul interviu în care am prezentat corupția din spatele științei climatice. Spuneam la un moment dat și doresc să repet aceasta și anume că cele 5 ore la care am avut prilejul să asist în luna martie nu sunt lecții despre știința mediului accesibile doar celor avansați, ci ele sunt lecții de viață din care aflăm acele lucruri despre natură, despre mediu, despre sistemele climatice, care își regăsesc utilitatea imediată în necesitățile vieții noastre. Prezentarea domnului profesor este o călătorie interdisciplinară, astfel construită încât e ca și când știința mediului ar fi doar una singură și care se revelează prin fațete distincte, precum un diamant bine șlefuit. Profesorul Tim Ball ne prezintă o realitate vie și complexă a modificărilor climatice, a fenomenelor naturale de risc, într-o ilustrare ce parcurge domenii interdisciplinare, precum fizica atmosferei, biologie, istorie medievală, geologie, climatologie, sociologie, psihologie, elemente de logică și filozofie științifică, științe agricole, geografia mediului, ecologie, electromagnetism, geomagnetism, astrofizică și arte vizuale. Veți afla lucruri despre planeta noastră, unele uimitoare, altele de-a dreptul incredibile. Am fost șocat să aflu, de exemplu, faptul că un detaliu mic de pe o pictură medievală releva grosimea gheții unui fluviu din Anglia în perioada micii ere glaciare, în timp ce alte picturi, sigur, dezvăluia elemente din care s-a estimat gradul de acoperire noroasă. În cel de-al patrulea episod al acestei miniserii rezervată schimbărilor climatice, Vom discuta despre circuitul apei în natură, în continuarea expunerii de data trecută, circuitul carbonului în natură, după care veți afla o știre de ultimă oră. Apa oceanelor și mărilor din prezent este într-o cantitate mult mai mare decât cea existentă în urmă cu 600 de milioane de ani, iar proveniența daosului nu se datorează erupțiilor vulcanice, ci spațiul extraterestru. Așadar, apa și nucleele de condensare provin din spațiul extraterestru. Mai mult, constituenții de bază ce se regăsesc în toate formele de viață, anumite hidrocarburi, provin tot din spațiul extraterestru. În timpul misiunilor Apollo pe Lună au fost descoperite asemenea hidrocarburi. Am mai abordat în acest episod și problema exploatărilor aurifere și folosirea cianurilor. Timbal a prezentat un punct de vedere interesant. Tot în acest episod veți afla lucruri interesante despre termoregulatorul climatic și faptul că norii au în componența lor alge oceanice, care și ele la rândul lor joacă un rol de nuclee de condensare. Și vom încheia cu problema incendiilor naturale, care au un rol determinant în însămânțarea pădurilor. Fiți alături de noi la acest eveniment special la știință și cunoaștere, împreună cu profesorul Tim Ball. Dear Professor Tim Ball, welcome to our Science and Knowledge TV program in Romania for part four of our second interview. Well, thank you, Christian, and, and uh, so glad to be part of this opportunity to help people understand their world. It is really amazing to learn so much about the climate science and most of the info are not to be found anywhere. And uh, to my surprise, after I wrote 10 years ago a 658 pages book about climate change, well, after these discussions with you, my book has a lot of mistakes and is very incomplete. Well, of course, it, it's, uh, you know, it's like I used to tell my students 
um, that if you're trying to sweep a concrete floor, you can keep sweeping almost forever. You keep raising dust. And things appear very simple on the surface, but as you look into them, they're actually very, very complex and complicated. And what's, what's lucky for humans is that we can walk around the world and uh, uh, essentially be ignorant of what's really happening around us. The problem is that that ignorance then makes us easily um, vulnerable to people that want to exploit information, particularly to scare you with uh, the sky is falling kind of situation. So um, I, I, I just, uh, just one little story with this, Christian, I think is important. Uh, after three years, a student came to me and he said, Dr. Ball, I've been in university for three years and all I've learned is that I don't know anything. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and my reply was, good, you're ready to graduate. <laughs> okay. Because once, once, you, once you realize how little you actually know, and by the way, there's a very important point with this, Christian, to your book. Um, one student um, wrote a, an essay for me and didn't reach a conclusion. And I said, well, okay, so you've done all this study, you've presented all this information. Well, what, what have you concluded? And the student said, well, I don't, I can't reach a conclusion. I don't know enough. I'm not clever enough to reach a conclusion. I said, look, if that was true, none of us would ever reach conclusions because we can never know everything. So it's like the person who never thinks they have enough money. So they, they keep going and going and going. But at some point, you have to stop and live. So you, you get all of your information, do the, the research as best as you can, like you've done, but you, and then you put that out there. So that's now your opinion. But here's the difference. If somebody else comes and says, well, look, here's some information that you didn't know about. You have two ways to react as a, as a scientist or as a person. You can say, don't confuse me with facts. I don't want to know. The English word for that is you are then opinionated. You're not listening. But what you should do is say, oh, let me look at that. Does that change what I understand? If it does, then you expand your knowledge, and that's what we're doing here. And and so it, it I don't think that anything ever is in, is um, incomplete or complete. It's just that, and, and again, uh, like I taught the students, I say, look, I'm going to tell you what we know today. It's more than we know yesterday, but it's less than what we will know tomorrow. That I'm going to tell you the truth, but it's today's truth. It wasn't yesterday's truth, but it won't be tomorrow's truth. And for a lot of people, and especially young people, they think, oh, science. And you hear the comment now in the climate issue, the science is settled. Well, people, intelligent people know science is never settled. It's a constant search for understanding and information. And we talked about this a little bit the other day when we talked about Bernowski's um, chapter in, in, in his book about how technology expanding our universe and, and, and uh, allowing us to see things we didn't know, well then that has to change how we think and how we see. And, and uh, so when, when these people now are saying with climate, oh, the science is settled, the debate is over, sorry, all you're doing with that is showing me your ignorance. Write some more about the water cycle. Yes, I, I have an article on, on there on my website called Water is Replacing Climate as the Next False UN Environmental Resource Scare. So if you just uh, put in the search, uh, water is replacing climate. Oh yes, so water is re replacing climate, yes. Okay, now if you, if you scroll down um, yes. to figure, figure three. Figure three, let me see. Yes, yes, 
Okay, the water cycle. Now, one of the things that we've been talking about is, uh, and, and in our discussions, we've been looking at just one small part of much larger systems, all right? And one of the things with climate is the carbon cycle. That is CO2 and how it moves through the atmosphere and through the oceans. And that's what, what we've been talking about with the CO2 and global warming. Well, the water cycle is a much larger uh, and, and very important uh, movement of water through our whole global system. And this water cycle, you can see here, and we'll start on the bottom right-hand side, water storage in oceans. Okay, we're, we're back to the water cycle diagram. Yes. Yes. You, you, can, you can edit that. Okay, what's this showing is how water moves through our system. And, and maybe uh, your in listeners would be interested in, I have had a campaign going for quite a while of changing the name of our planet from Earth to water because water is so much more important and of course what interests me and we did talk about this when when they go to other places in the universe and they're looking for water because they think that's essential to life well it is life as we know it but it isn't there may be other life forms that don't need water but but we're very narrow in our thinking uh, but what this diagram shows the water cycle is that most of the world's uh, water is in the oceans and there's a great debate about where that water came from originally. Um, now, they talk about the Earth as it's cooling down and shrinking, then gravity takes over, so the denser material goes to the center of the Earth, what we call the solid inner core, where the density is about 19 times uh, the density at the surface of one. And then the lighter materials, as you go up through, so you reach the crust of the Earth, then the water, which is less than one density, and then the atmosphere, which is less dense than water. So the layers from the center of the Earth out are all a function of gravity and the density of the materials. Well, water, um, they always argued that the water on the Earth came as the Earth was cooling down. So as the Earth cooled down, uh, the gases appeared and the atmosphere appeared and water vapor uh, appeared from within the rock. And, it, and as the Earth cooled, it condensed, clouds formed and you got the rain falling, which eventually filled up the oceans. It's, there's, a, it's, there's quite a few people now, and NASA certainly looking at this, believe that the oceans and the water on Earth has actually come from space. And they have satellite images of, the, of showing this, that the Earth is constantly being bombarded with uh, everything from space. We talked about cosmic radiation and other things. And um, in fact, a scientist who was with NASA uh, kept pushing this idea, and they actually fired him because he was too controversial. But if you take the rate at which these uh, water vapor as a gas is, is raining down on the Earth and, and then take the age of the Earth, then that, that creates enough water to fill up the oceans. But if you look at the, the geologic textbooks, which the students are learning, that is today's truth, okay, then they, they tell you that the oceans were essentially formed and really haven't changed in 600 million years. That simply doesn't make sense, but that's how we think right now, and that's what people are being taught. Now, what happens is that the energy from the sun, and you can see in that diagram of the water cycle, the heat from the sun, and we talked about it in the last segment, some of that heat from the sun heats up the water. Now, every and, and heat is simply molecular movement. But just please let's hold for a moment. You, you said that there are research in our modern times saying that we have much more water than we had 600 million years ago. Yes. And it didn't came from volcanoes. No, there is some coming from volcanoes. There is because water vapor is 
does come out, CO2 and other gases come out from the volcanoes. But that's not sufficient to explain the volume of water that's in the oceans. So if you take rock, and say, well, how much water vapor as a gas does it contain? It, it can't explain the volumes of the ocean. But how could we estimate so accurately the total volume of water from the planetary ocean 600 million years ago? Well, that, that's part of the problem. That's, that's part of the problem because if, you're go if you need to know how much change occurs, you need to know your starting point and your ending point. That's the only way. So, uh, but even with very crude estimates, um, and by the way, that's a question that's always asked of me. Well, well, how do we know what the temperature was 100 million years ago? And there's various ways of determining it. As a scientist, you never, ever rely on one piece of evidence to support your argument. You find, uh, and you want to get evidence that's independent, right? We talked about correlation. So if you can find evidence here, that's why I did that study on the clouds from the paintings, because the artist wasn't interested in, when he painted the paintings, he didn't care how much cloud there was in, in 1700. He was just painting what they saw. So if you take that then as eyewitness evidence, it's what somebody saw and, and painted, then it's independent evidence. There's no, it's not corrupted evidence. So whenever, whenever you're trying to recreate the past, you try and find as many different pieces of evidence to support your conclusion as you can. But what you are saying is absolutely incredible. Yes. Because billions of, and billions of liters of water came from outer space? Yes, yes, yeah. Christian, uh, there was a, a, a Russian doctor and scientist by the name of Velikovsky, Emmanuel Velikovsky. He was uh, brutally and viciously attacked because he dared to suggest that Venus as a planet is not part of our uh, planetary system as it originally formed. Because one of the things about Venus one of the things about Venus is that when you look, when you're looking down on our solar system, the planets are all going around the sun in one direction, and each planet is spinning around its axis in the same direction, except Venus. Venus is spinning in the opposite direction. Now, it's spinning very slowly in the opposite direction, but it's spinning in the opposite direction. Now, that, do, that contradicts the idea that uh, you know it was material that the, the sun was formed and the planets were were formed by collections of, of of galactic dust and all then spinning in the same direction. Venus doesn't fit that. But here's another thing: Velikovsky said, and he wrote about it in a book called Worlds in Collision, and another book called Earth's in Upheaval. He um, he also said, look, you're going to find hydrocarbons which are the building block of life throughout the universe. And he said, I predict when you go to the moon and get samples of soil from the moon, you will find hydrocarbons. They said, it can't be. You need plant life to have hydrocarbons. You could only have hydrocarbons from organic material. They brought the samples of soil back from the moon with the Apollo what did they find? Hydrocarbons on the moon. They weren't supposed to be there. But still, nobody wants to still there is no life on the moon. No life on the moon, nor, or life as we know it. Right? But the question is, yeah, how could you have hydrocarbons if you need life to have hydrocarbons? How do the hydrocarbons get there? So Velikovsky made a whole series of predictions, all of which have come true. He was attacked to the point where um, he, his book was a bestseller. Earth, uh, Worlds in Collision was a bestseller. And Macmillan Publishing all of a sudden 
sold off the rights to their best-selling book. No explanation, just suddenly. So it's like saying, well, here's the, here's the product that's getting me the most money. Oh, I'll sell it. It turned out, and this was disclosed by students who got the, the letter, that a geology professor at, at, at an American university, Harlow Shapley, wrote a letter to Macmillan and said, either you stop publishing that book by Velikovsky, or I will stop all of my colleagues uh, printing their university textbooks through Macmillan Publishing. And the textbook publishing was a very large part of their business. So what they did was they said, okay, we'll get rid of Velikovsky. They, they were challenged about it. The professor denied he'd ever done anything. And then the letter was found by the students at Harvard University and said, here's exactly what went on. Uh, Velikovsky um, uh, died, um, you know, it, I mean, it broke his heart. And, and, and he, 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 um, uh, he, he didn't defend himself. He couldn't defend himself, partly because he was, he'd, he'd come to America in the 50s during the Cold War and, and you know, uh, McCarthy and era. He was Jewish. He was a medical doctor. And he went to a conference on uh, geo, on soils and, and uh, the, the moon. And somebody got up and said, you're not qualified. You don't have a PhD. He went and got a PhD in the subject and went back to the conference. So this is one of the problems in science. And you see this with the climate issue. People that are trying to practice proper science are attacked. They are silenced. They are, you know, they, oh, they're paid by the oil companies. They're liars. They're cheats. They're this and that. And if you look at the history of science with Copernicus and Galileo and anybody that's dared to challenge what the, co the society and the culture think is, is truth are immediately attacked. And it's a, a real challenge in science. So th this idea about how the water got onto the planet is, is one of these issues that's now under debate. And if you think about it, saying you've got a world where in 600 million years all of the continents have moved around and changed mountains have been created such as the himalayas and then say oh well the oceans have been the same for 600 million years it doesn't make any sense right uh, but that's that's uh, what's going on and and so uh, by starting with the oceans as i've done in this water cycle and you look at the volumes of water that are in the oceans, it, it represents 70% of the, of the surface of the earth. And of course, about 97% of all the, earth, all the water that's on the planet is in the oceans. Please let's go back to the water cycle and follow the drawing. So first we have evaporation from the ocean and then condensation. Right then, it, yeah, evaporation. You see, and then it, it then it moves in the cycle. It, it condenses, and as it's cooled, the clouds form, and then the precipitation falls either as snow in the mountains, and you can see, or onto the surface, and then that two parts of it. One is in the brown part, which is underneath the ground. The water flows through the ground. We've already talked about that a bit, and you can see the lake there. Where the that's where the water table is at the surface, and you've got a lake formed, but the water goes through the ground and back into the oceans on the bottom. Now there are parts of the world, for example, in Florida, where they go out and tap into that fresh water on the bottom of the ocean. Okay, that sounds weird, but they actually get fresh water from springs on the bottom of the ocean that are freshwater springs. It's the same way as with the Amazon River. There is so much water flowing down the Amazon River that the ocean, it's fresh water for about 280 kilometers off the coast. And so you can go with a tanker and simply drop a pump in and fill up your water tanker with water and it's all fresh water. That's the volumes of fresh water. So you've got that 
that precipitation that's fallen on the ground returning to the oceans under the ground, but you've also got uh, the overland flow. So you can see in the center the snow melt runoff to streams and then the surface runoff uh, going back to the oceans, completing the complete cycle, the complete water cycle. Yeah. And of course, uh, wherever that's interfered with, uh, either by a dam or not being able to get back to the river, but eventually it will make the complete cycle. And so when, when you build a dam, for example, you slow down the rate of runoff and you create a, an artificial lake, but eventually that lake will disappear. Please tell us the difference between human impact over the ecosystem and human impact over climate forces and how much is that impact? Because people make confusion. They think human impact is mostly on the climate and less on the ecosystem. But I believe it's the opposite. It, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, and now, uh, again, we need, to, we need to start. Pe people live and there's, they're seeing pe people all around them and they, they drive along a road and there seem to be lots of people around. But 97% of the world is unoccupied. That the people live in very a very small part of the Earth's surface. And they're concentrated. And they're mostly concentrated in river deltas, such as the Ganges or the Nile or in Europe the flatlands, the, the Rhine, and all of those areas, because they live in areas where they can produce food. It's agricultural land, flat land, good, uh, good, they can grow crops and, and practice agriculture. If you look at a country like Canada, which is the second largest country in the world, which has a population equal to the population of California, and one of the things that, um, uh, when I was flying search and rescue in the Arctic in Canada, looking for missing airplanes, we were in northern Canada at a place called Fort Chippewyan. And uh, was, there had been bad weather. The bush pilots took off, but went back, said, no, the weather's too bad to fly. An American and his wife and uh, two of his business partners she, he bought her a plane for her birthday. They decided they were gonna fly south to Edmonton. The plane disappeared, the search started. And after about oh, three days, some of the friends of the family showed up, one of the brothers of the guy that was missing, and he flew in our airplane with us. We took off, we were flying all morning, Lunchtime comes, he comes up into the cockpit, very angry. He said, I am going to report you to the government. You guys are just flying around in circles. He said, what are you talking about? I took the map and I said, look, we're flying like this and down and this and down, what we call a creeping line, it's covering there. We have covered over 20,000 square kilometers this morning. And he said, but I haven't seen a road. I haven't seen any evidence of humans at all. I said, welcome to Canada. There are no people in there. You already told us this story in the first interview. First, exactly, so that's what we're back to now. So when we talk about the ecosystem, what part of it are humans affecting? And the answer is very little of it. Now, where we, where we do have an effect, there are places where the impact has become negative, that is created pollution. But I want people to think about all of those definitions of terms assume that humans are not natural. All right, we've talked about this as well, right? The idea that, that people, because this is the contradiction you talk to the uh, environmentalists, they say, oh, do you believe in Darwin? Yes. Okay, well, then humans are the most successful animal. Oh, no, 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 can't do that. We've got to get rid of all those people. Too many people making too much of a mess. Well, aren't we the most successful animal? What, what's wrong with that? And, and if, if so the difference is, of course, is that we have um, an awareness 
we have a knowledge of what we do and the effects that it can have. But don't confuse that with saying, well, we're not, we're not different than all the other animals. So when we, what we're into now is a period of environmentalism where people are saying, oh, humans are a destructive force. We're having a negative impact. We've always had impact. Every animal has an impact. Have you ever seen a, a, a piece of the jungle or the forest when a herd of elephants have gone through? I mean, it's just devastation. And, and, and when beavers build dams and they flood vast areas, and does that not affect the animals that were living where that lake is now created by the beaver? Well, why is it okay for beavers to build dams? Well, they build dams because they want the, the heat from the water in the winter time, and they want to be able to store their food under the water so they can get it in the... How is that different from humans building a dam to produce electricity <laughs> to heat their homes and grow food? But somehow, people don't make those connections. So we're in an age now where um, every change is due to humans and, and every change is negative and wrong. That's simply not the case at all. That, as I said, 97% of the Earth, uh, humans have, have had no impact. So the idea, um, we've created this idea of ecosystems that, and, and it's part of the evolution of science, you see, because before Darwin, the belief was that you started with the most primitive creature, the amoeba, and then you human, humans at the top of that. And it was called the great chain of being. And the argument is made that, oh, if any one species goes extinct, uh, that the whole chain will break down. Well, 99% of all the uh, animals that have ever been on the planet are now extinct. Extinction is the normal. And th this is another of the great myths that's been created. And the, the other, uh, the other myth, myth is, and we get back to what we talked about with data, it's estimated, and I've got a couple of articles on my website about this, it's estimated that we've only identified and named 35% of all the species on the planet as it is today. And that's not just small creatures. I mean, every, last week they announced they discovered 21 new fairly large species. They had the Vietnam War, and about 10 years ago they discovered an animal the size of a small cow that nobody even knew existed. Well, how does that happen? And the answer is because we, we think we know everything about the Earth, but we know virtually nothing. So how can you argue that we're having an impact on an ecosystem if you don't even know what's in that ecosystem? Now, that's one problem. The second problem is, unless you have a base, and you know in science, you must establish a baseline. Now, we talked about this when we were saying creating rainfall. If you don't know how much was the cloud would have rained in the first place, you can't determine how much effect you're having by seeding the cloud, right? So you need a base. Whenever you do a medical study, of an area and say, well, like after Chernobyl, for example, they want to say, well, how much can how much has cancer increased because of the um, explosion? Well, if you don't know how much cancer there was or what the rate of cancer trend was before Chernobyl, you can't possibly determine accurately the impact of it. That's the problem we have everywhere. And it was, goes back to your question about, well, how do we know what the ocean was 600 million years ago? Well, you have to try and determine that if you're going to start to understand how much has changed and then what has caused those changes. So when we look at the Earth and the ecosystems, our knowledge about, uh, about the, even the basics uh, are very, very primitive. I can tell you in Canada that it's only 20 years ago that we finally got uh, maps of the surface of Canada. And there's many parts of the world that haven't been mapped at all. And when I was flying search and rescue in the Arctic in Canada, um, there were large areas in the Arctic where it said 
terra incognito. Well, that's what used to appear on medieval maps because it was it means unknown land, unknown territory. And, and so uh, this idea that we know so much about the Earth, that we understand all the ecosystems, is absolute nonsense. And But because people don't know that, then people can come along and say, oh, are these, these uh, we're having this impact or that impact. It's virtually impossible to measure the impact. On a global scale, yes, on, on a large scale. But please let me tell you about a particular situation happening in Romania. Although the action itself it did not start it, there is a strong debate for over 10 years or more. In a place called Russia Montana, we have a gold mine, and a foreign company wants to extract the gold using cyanide, a lot of cyanide. And we have concentrated population, because we are a small country, but having 20 million people. So the impact of human over ecosystem is important be, because the population is very concentrated. Okay, were, were, were they using cyanide or arsenic or both? I'm not sure, but this is only a debate. It did not start it yet. Well, because with gold mining, the most common problem is arsenic because arsenic is used in the, in the processing of the gold. So it, it, they, I'm not saying they weren't using cyanide, but it's also arsenic is a problem. Okay, here, here's, here is the point. I am not saying that humans are not having an impact or a negative impact in some areas. The history is that uh, in, in recent times, we now become aware of the problem and we either prevent it happening or correct it, okay? Yes. But that, that uh, it is a, a, it's like the same idea. A problem is only a problem if you're not aware of it. So now you say to that company, okay, you want to do gold mining and you want to use these processes, prove to us that you can do it without it having a negative impact. The other side of that story is, of course, that people need jobs, that people need the economy. And, and so you, you've got to find a balance between, and you can only do that if you understand nature. Now, I'll give you an example of the kinds of, of problems that fit into your argument. They were, uh, people were accusing uh, a mining company of putting mercury into the waters in a part of Canada. And they went and looked at the uh, Indian people and they said, look, they've got all of these health problems and it's because of the mercury. Well, and there was millions of dollars paid out and millions of dollars spent on fixing up the problem. It didn't change it. The truth was that the mercury in the water was from natural sources. In fact, one of the ways that you find lead and zinc is you measure the amount of mercury in the water, and as you get close to the deposits of lead and zinc, the mercury in the water goes up. The health problems that the, that the Indian people were having were almost all due to alcohol, not mercury poisoning. Okay? So... I'm not saying that that you don't have difficulty and that there aren't problems, but you need to be very careful that you know what the problems are. Yes, but the work, uh, it did not start it. There is only the debate about. Well, I, I think that uh, what, what you have to do is you, you can, obviously you can say, no, we won't allow any mining. We won't allow any development. I mean, if you think about that in terms of human history, which, well, no development. And then you end up uh, living like the cave people. You know, that's part of natural evolution is that as our brains have developed and we've developed science and we've developed, uh, that, is, that is part of natural evolution. But notice, and th this goes back to the uh, uh, 17th century and Darwin and free thought and rationalism and all of those other issues that have been going on for 300 years, 
part of human evolution is an advance in our brain, an advance in our social system. But think about it this way, Christian. We've only, the world has really only tried two very crude socioeconomic systems. We had capitalism, which essentially is from Darwin, survival of the fittest. And we've had communism, right? Which is, oh no, everything's equal. All things are the same. We've got a level. Well, they both failed for one reason, and that is greed. Because you see, capitalism exploits human greed. Communism doesn't acknowledge that greed exists, <laughs> right? But but we all know that's not true. So uh, the. But now we're tar starting to look at different forms of socioeconomic systems. I mean, one of the things that's going on in China, for example, is a combination of state and capitalism. So they've got this capitalist economy, but it's controlled by the state. Americans say, no, you got too much government, too much state. Look at what happened to the different countries after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Most of them went with a flat tax. Most of them are still trying to set up a, a, a workable socioeconomic system. So the same is true about gold mines and about development. What you have to do is you have to get, first of all, identify that whether or not there's a problem. If you decide there's a problem, then you get as much of the data and facts in, and information as you can but what happens is that people come along and because they know that the public don't understand, they can say, oh, well, they're, they're going to kill all these people. This is all, oh, this is going to be terrible. They can, they can play on emotionalism. And, and um, so, it, it, you know, there's an English phrase that said that the, the tail wags the dog. Okay, I don't know if they have something like that in Romanian. But the, the tail is wagging the dog. Oh, yes. The, the tail is moving the dog. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Because most people just trying to survive, and there's a few people that are actually controlling everything. Well, nowadays what we've got is a flea on a hair on the tail of the dog is wagging the dog. Yes. Okay. So you've got one or two people, and of course, what do they do? They come along and say, oh, you, I, I'm here to save the planet. I'm here to save the children. And what, you don't care about the planet. You don't care about the children. And of course, that gives them moral high ground. When in fact, they wouldn't have allowed any of the development that's gone on in human history. I really would need a part five to complete all these stories you are telling us because they are so fascinating. There is a theory about the so-called natural climate thermoregulator, which had been postulated by the biologist Bill Hamilton, saying that green algae from the ocean can be lifted up into the atmosphere. Because on the surface of the ocean, there is uh, waves which creates bubbles, and when bubbles broke down, the green algae can be lifted up, and scientists uh, took samples of air from the nearby surface of the ocean, then from the clouds, and the clouds contained algae. It's a long story, but can you tell us more about this natural mechanism? Yeah, what that's part of the water cycle that we just finished talking about. Everything is moving through the system. And um, uh, just to give you an idea, um, before I was flying in the Arctic, flying, I was flying anti-submarine patrols over the Atlantic Ocean. A new volcano island appeared off the coast of Iceland. And they decided that they would not allow anybody onto the island for a couple of weeks. And then they had scientists went with complete uh, clothing so they wouldn't contaminate the island because they wanted to see how quickly life appeared on the island. And they were, the, they were absolutely amazed that um, the first creatures to arrive were spiders. And you say, well, how could spiders appear 
out in the middle of the ocean? And the answer is that in the atmosphere, spiders spin out of their, their web and they drift with the wind. There are spiders on the top of Mount Everest. Okay? And, and then the birds are flying around. The birds fly over the island. They've eaten seeds. They drop the seeds on the island along with the fertilizer. And within three weeks, seeds were growing on the island. That's how quickly that island became infused with life. My point is that there are things going on. There is so much movement. And, uh, you know, I used to tell my students, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, we're going to kill all the plants. I said, if you think that's true, try and keep the weeds out of a garden and you find out how tough it is, right? And, and, and so what, what he's talking about there is that the, uh, at the surface of the earth and the atmosphere, we call that an interface, so that you've got two completely different um, areas. And you remember in one of the earlier programs, we did the layers of the atmosphere, where you had the troposphere, the stratosphere, the chemistry and the biology in each of those layers is very different. But where the layers meet is uh, very important. It's the same thing, and again, this will surprise people, but the most one of the most important organs of your body is your skin. People don't even think about skin as an organ, but it is. And if you take the human skin and spread it out, the area of it is very large. But that is the point at which you interact with the world around you. Sweating, absorbing, everything interacting through your skin. And, and so your skin is, is a in, very important thing. Well, the surface of the earth and the ocean and the atmosphere is a very, very critical layer, okay? Now, in, in climate science, we call that the boundary layer. And one of the things I want you to think about, Christian, is we measure the temperature of the Earth in a white box 1.25 meters above the surface of the Earth. It's called a Stevenson screen. You can go to any weather station and you see them, and the instruments are inside. But the temperature at 1.25 meters above the Earth is very, very different than the right at the surface. It's a completely different. So down at the surface, you have a microclimate that's different than the actual what they're measuring in the weather station. Okay, so trying to determine what's going on in that lower one and a quarter meters of the Earth and the interaction is extremely difficult. We've we've done, not done it in very very many parts of the world. We certainly haven't done much of it over the oceans, and that's what they're talking about in that experiment. Okay, they were flying above, but then what's going on below the airplane? I can tell you that when we were flying over the Atlantic Ocean, we're flying at uh, you know 200 meters above the surface because we needed to be able to detect submarines underneath the surface. After 12 hours, we would land and we would have to wash down our airplane because it was completely encrusted with salt. Because the salt's moving out of the ocean into the atmosphere and being carried by the wind throughout the atmosphere. So what he's talking about then is that there are um, uh, biotic creatures, the, the, the algae and so on. Yeah, the green algaes, those are being carried throughout the atmosphere as well. And what he's suggesting is that uh, we can capture those. The problem with any of those ideas is that you must know how much energy is required and then what effect it's going to have. I mean, one of the things that they're, that one of the criticisms of fossil fuels is to say, well, we're taking the fuel out of the ground and, and it's not being replaced, so it's going to run out. Well, now we find out that it is being replaced. So then they say, well, we burn the fossil fuel and it produces CO2, and that's causing uh, uh, 
runaway global warming. It's terrible. Every, every single action, there's a reaction. There is another interesting thing, and, and that is nature has amazing automated mechanisms which are based on the existence of fires. The lodgepole pine, for example, can only spread the seeds over the land when the temperature of the cone exceeds 140 degrees Celsius. And while the entire forest is burning, the pine delivers the seeds. But not knowing this detail, the Canadian and American Forest Protection Services intervened and they thought that if they reduce the density of the trees per square meter, then the fires won't burn the entire forest. However, in doing so, the pines just got old, die, and never deliver their seeds on the ground. So now they are letting the forest burn because a new one will be born from ashes. Exactly. Uh, with the exceptions of uh, the human habitat, uh, which if it is in danger, then they will intervene to protect it. Okay, now the, the other part of that was that, that um, fires are necessary for re renewal of life, and not just with the pine cone. F uh, grass fires kill off the old dead vegetation. They occur from lightning strikes. In fact, we have less forest fires now in many parts of the world than we used to have because now people go and put out the forest fires. Well, in, 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 a, in the uh, parks systems in America and Canada, they said, we're going to not allow the fires to occur. Well, you, you get two different types of forest fire. One, which is natural, which is the crown fire, which just simply goes through, kills off the dead vegetation, causes the pine cones to regenerate and so on. If you don't have that kind of fire, then the material builds up, the dead material builds up. Once the fire starts in that, and it's what we call a base fire, you can actually get to the point where the ground will start to burn because so much heat is generated. Then you can't put the fire out. And now there are many parts of the world where the ground is burning naturally. For example, in the Arctic, in the, in the Muskeg, uh, uh, there was one place where every time there was a plane went missing, people would say, oh, we saw smoke in this area. We went up there while well, it was where the ground was burning. And the, burn, the ground was burning very deep down into the ground. It had been burning for 300 years that we know about because a, a, an explorer had reported it. There's places in the United States where coal seams are burning. A place called Clinton in Pennsylvania. The coal's been burning there as long as anybody's ever known. None of that's talked about, it, by the way, in terms of natural CO2 going into the atmosphere. But the forest fires are very much a part of the renewal system. And, and uh, so by not understanding how nature works and those natural processes, and this is, this is again the issue. And it's back to the point I was making a little bit earlier. It's like they, they said, oh, well, CO2 is a problem. We've got to get rid of fossil fuels. Oh, we'll, we'll have alternate energy. We'll create new forms of, of energy. We'll have solar power. We'll have wind power. But they never, ever did the proper scientific analysis and the economic analysis of, okay, what is the cost of doing this and what are the benefits? So in everything that humans do, there's a cost and there's a benefit. And you have to weigh do the benefits outweigh the cost? If they do, then you do it. If they don't, you don't do it. But if you don't know the, the data and you don't understand the mechanisms, uh, or you don't even do a cost benefit. May I change the tape? Oh, yes, absolutely. The last tape, okay. So we meet again uh, for part five. Okay. Data viitoare, la episodul al cincelea despre climă și mediu, vom vorbi despre marile circuite climatice El Niño-La Niña din Oceanul Pacific, 
problema soluilor, creșterea plantelor, urșii polari. Vom afla mai multe despre aerosoli și influența acestora asupra temperaturii mediului. După care Tim Ball ne va spune și concluziile referitoare la întreaga sa activitate și conceptele filozofice care l-au ghidat și condus în cercetare și desigur vestea bună este aceea că mi-a promis o colaborare pe termen lung. Așadar, multe alte interviuri și discuții pe teme legate de știința mediului. Cea mai mare problemă ce îmi părea de netrecut era aceea că specialiștii din domeniul mediului și al geografiei mediului nu au și probabil nu pot face abordările multidisciplinare de care aș fi avut nevoie pentru emisiuni. Fiecare își cunoaște foarte bine o anumită felie sau subdomeniu de specializare, dar acestea nu sunt decât piese ale unui joc de puzzle care nu puteau dezvălui imaginea de ansamblu. Nici istoria nu e o știință unică, ci este o multidisciplină, dar ceea ce se predă în școli e doar o felie extrem de îngustă ce limitează și chiar distorsionează imaginea de ansamblu a istoriei ce cuprinde toate aspectele vieții. Fiți alături de noi data viitoare! La o nouă întâlnire cu știință și cunoaștere.